Hey, look at this, all dressed up, nowhere to go, right? But I am coming to you online, obviously, and I'm wanting to share the Word of the Lord with you today. So excited about it. And uh, of course, I'm going to continue on from where I was last week. We're talking about the sons of Zion, very exciting, and the sons of Greece and wanting to see the difference between the two because the Bible says the sons of Zion will overcome the sons of Greece. And so our opening scripture was found in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, where, of course, the uh, Apostle Peter was speaking on the day of Pentecost. And he said, Repent, therefore, and return that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing. Man, do we ever need that? Times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And it's great to know that times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. And it goes on to say in verse 20 that he may send Jesus, hallelujah, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive. In other words, must hold on to us. Like I joked last week, it's like he's in lockdown. He's locked up and, you know, not literally, you know what I'm talking about. Heaven must hold on to, receive until the period of restoration of all things, which was spoken by, uh, which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets in ancient times. And so I believe we're living in interesting times where we're seeing much of what the minor prophets spoke about uh, coming to pass today. Even what's happening in Afghanistan now, it's so interesting and around the Middle East. But, you know, it talks in Romans 13, just doing a little of a recap, particularly in relation to the scriptures to get us all on board. If you didn't join us last week, and I know we're going right across the world, we're going obviously to all our campuses in the South Island and, and here in the North Island. And I, I greet you all in the name of the Lord. And it says here in Romans 8, verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. What, a, what an honor, what a privilege, you know, to be called a son of God. You were born, we're reborn, born again into the family of God, a son of God, a son of the Most High. Let me give you another scripture, Galatians 3, 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that if you're a son, then you're a joint heir with Christ. Think about that. I mean, think about the galaxies, the universe. Think about eternity. We are joint heirs with Christ. He's our older brother, the one who went before and made a way for us, just like Joseph made a way for his brothers, right? In Romans 8, it goes on, but you did not receive the, the spirit of bondage again to fear. Amazing how many people are in fear today with what's going on in the world. Our headlines and the papers is just fear after fear. We're not of that, but we receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, hallelujah, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if join, children, ears, ears of God, joined ears with Christ. And it says, if indeed we suffer with him, and there is some obviously suffering in the world today. Think of some Christians in Afghanistan. Think of some Christians in Ethiopian places as well and a lot of children. And it says here that we may also be glorified together. And then it goes on to talk about the expectation of creation eagerly awaiting the revealing. We mentioned that last week, the manifestation of the sons of God. Wow. And uh, it goes on to say in verse 22, we know the whole of creation groans and labors for birth pangs ready for now. So I did make mention and I just, I have to say it again, the problem with this planet, it's not global warming. The problem with the planet is sin, right? Let's be honest. It's because of sin that the planet is out of whack and it's groaning and longing. And so we're seeing all this coming to pass today, the floods and the fires and different things. And uh, it says in verse 24, but we are saved in this hope, this hope. What a great hope Christians have. I've been to many Christian uh, funeral services and, you know, there's always great hope there. You go to, and with all respect, a non-Christian service and often there's not a lot of hope. Sometimes they say, you know, well, I hope he's up there looking down at me or they say those kind of things and rest in peace and, and all that. But there's no genuine hope. But those who've got blessed assurance, Jesus, mind, we've got that hope. And so the manifestations of the sons of God and what was spoken by the, by the prophets of old. And so we talked about how Daniel, of course, we're going to look at that as a last day's book, a prophetic book. Zechariah is as well and Ezekiel. But in Zechariah 9.12, 
and this is where we get our scripture for this message from, return to the stronghold, O prisoners who have the hope. Hallelujah. This is the day I'm declaring to you that I will restore double to you. Uh, we just got to hold on to the promises of God and believe what the word of God says. I will bend Judah's my bow, I will fill the bow with Ephraim. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece. Talking about two different families, two different camps here, right? And we saw how the Lord's going to blow the trumpet and, and how Daniel 10 says, do not be afraid, but be, cur cur uh, be courageous. And then it talks also about the prince of Greece and, uh, and the prince of Persia. In other words, demonic spirits. We do live in a spiritual world. A lot of people don't want to know about it. A lot of people want to ignore it. But I'm going to be talking about it today. And uh, in verse 12, it says, do not be afraid. And then it talks about the latter days. And so we're coming to where I left it off last week. But just before we get there, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar has dreams and visions. Man, what a king he was. He built the great Babylonian gardens and so forth and uh, ruled the known world at the time. But the thing was, he was a man who had a lot of dreams and uh, they were interpreted by Daniel, which is incredible. And a lot of them are futuristic dreams as well. Some of them are uh, re um, uh, re uh, re related to him. Uh, if you know about the tree that was cut down and he had to wander like a wild animal for seven years, interesting. But enough to say Daniel chapter 2 verse 31, he talks about, uh, Daniel talks about the dream of the great statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw. And this is where we left it last week in relation to this, because this was a last day prophecy and I don't have time to read it, but you can read it in the book of Daniel about this great statue. It had a head of gold and Daniel said, that's you, Nebuchadnezzar, that's the Babylonian empire. Then it, uh, another kingdom will arise after you. And that was the Persian empire, the chest. And that was silver in the vision, the, the statue, the head was gold, the chest was silver. And that was the Persian empire. Uh, every theologian would agree with that. And then the middle and the belly and the thighs were bronze. And that was the kingdom of Greece that ruled the world at that time. And I mentioned that was where the reproductive organs are. That's where everything flowed out of. And then the legs uh, were the legs of Rome, iron, iron. Uh, Rome was an iron empire, chariots and swords, you know, the gladiator story. And uh, then you saw the feet. And the Rome is mixed in the last kingdom, iron mixed with clay. And uh, 10 toes, the 10 horns, talking about the book of Revelation and uh, without getting too deep into it, but of course in the return series, I cover some of this. But it was a Roman empire that carried, because the legs carried the Greek culture all over the world. Now this is where we got to and I hope you didn't mind a little recap, but hey, we were at home, uh, locked up, and so obviously we got time to do it. Um, but 2,500 years ago, I know a lot of people would have heard of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, sorry, my pronunciation. Um, I, I'm a little bit like Moses. I, I can't speak that well, but in any case, I can't make excuses. So most people have heard of these people. These people were, were philosophers and they molded the times. They shaped and influenced the, uh, the, the, the society for, for decades to come. Uh, and they were disciples of, of, of obviously other Greek um, philosophers as well. And uh, many would have heard of Herodias. Herodias, he was born 484 BC, died 425. He is known as a father of history. His sayings, along with others like, can I just give you another couple of Greek philosophers' names? They got, it's not like Peter, James, and John, so forgive me. Protagoras, Protagoras, and Hercules, Hercules. These people shape society. Protoclorius, he was a man who said, man is a measure of all things. He lived in the fifth century. Hercules, he said that the only constant in life is change. Interesting today, every leadership guru in the world says that. It all flowed back from there. And, and he was the one who said everything flows as well. Uh, you can't step into the same river twice and all this kind of stuff. But in any case, man is a measure of all things. This was a humanistic philosophy that flowed out of Greece, all right? Flowed out of Greece. Now, the interesting thing is Zechariah, we read that the sons of Zion will rise up and overcome the sons of of Greece. The sons of Zion will overpower the sons of Greece. So basically what I'm talking about here is a God mindset over, a, if I use the word, a Western worldly mindset. The worldview basically is how you see things, how you perceive things. Isn't it true? If you look through yellow 
Uh, glasses, you see everything yellow. You look through red glasses, you see everything red. It's the way you see it. And therefore, the way you see it is what you react. It's the old saying is you, you get what you look for. If you look for red cars on the road, just bet every car's red. You know, I'm sure you've played those games with your kids, great games to play during the lockdown, except we're not driving around, right? Not many red cars on the road, but red cars do go faster. In any case, the way you live your life uh, flows out of how you perceive life and how do you live your life. I mean, to be honest, if you listen to all the news and the rhetoric and what's coming down, I mentioned on my post, I was looking one day uh, in the news feed of the, of the major newspaper in New Zealand, 15 articles, top articles, every article was about, you know, the pandemic that's going on. It was all creating fear. I mean, it's just like this massive propaganda machine to get people into fear. And, uh, you know, I'm interested, of course, in what's going on in the world, as, uh, like I mentioned, Afghanistan, uh, other places around the world, the Paralympics didn't even get a mention. And so the thing is, is that if you fill your head with that, and one of the uh, headlines was, you've got a reason to be worried. And if you just read all that, you're going to have a reason to be worried, right? And uh, it just plays in your head. So what's playing in your head? I want to play in my head and my headline and God we trust, right? And God we trust. And we will not fear because God is with us. The best of all, God is with us. And so what's playing out in your head? How do you see the world right now? I know in the natural, there might be a lot to be fearful of, but we are not people of fear. We're people of faith. Amen. And so Genesis 3.15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will bruise you on the head and you will bruise him on the heel. In other words, two seeds, two cultures. So God was about to make himself a people. And of course, out of Abraham's loins came the nation of Israel. Now, the Bible says they are a special people. They are even a peculiar people. Doesn't the New Testament talk to us about the same thing? And they were keepers of the oracles of God, keepers of the Word of God. Now, it goes without saying, and I know sometimes people kind of get taken back because they think Jesus had blonde hair and blue eyes, but he was Jewish, right? Peter, James, and John were Jewish. Paul was Jewish. All the biblical traditions came from a Jewish philosophy, a Jewish mindset, a Jewish culture, not a Greek culture. Not a Greek culture we'll talk about, but a Jewish mindset. The sons of Zion will overcome the sons of Greece. And so not a Greek mindset. We need a godly mindset, right? And so a Jewish world worldview, not a Greek worldview. And so the Gentiles, the Greeks, the Romans, the Bible says that they are grafted in. And so praise God, because of the blinding of the nation of Israel, we get grafted in. But so often we want to bring our mindset into the kingdom of God. And uh, the Western church has been so influenced by the Greek mindset. I'll talk about some things as we go on. And this is such a great topic for today because this is the age in which we're living in where I believe the sons of Zion will overcome the sons of Greece, right? And so whether you know it or not, the Bible, <laughs> the church is deeply rooted in a Judaism culture in a Jewish culture, in a godly culture, in an Abrahamic culture. The sons of Zion. Zion basically means Jerusalem. Now, Mount Zion, we all know about. I remember walking around in Jerusalem. Uh, we got there one night. Didn't even realize it was the 50th anniversary of the 1948. So this is 1998. And we're walking around. And next thing, we we're already up Mount Zion. It's like, it's like I was expecting, you know, like Mount Taranaki. I was expecting a mountain. Not quite like that, but enough to say it was just like a slope going up Queen Street, really. But, uh, and that's in Auckland, by the way, for those who are around the world. But the interesting thing, as the sons of Zion, but Zion can also refer to the whole nation of Israel. And so the Judaism culture is totally different to the Greek culture. And of course, the Greek culture is what we are brought up in Western nations here in New Zealand, Australia, America, all have a Greek philosophy. And I'll talk about what that means. And so the two are actually opposed to one another. No wonder we have to be born again. No wonder we have to renew our mind with the word of God because we've had all that rubbish put in us. And uh, we're taken out of one kingdom, the Bible says, out of one domain of darkness and placed into the kingdom of light. And so all the nations of biblical times, we know, believed in many gods. You've got so many nations back then, the Philistites and all the other rights that go away with it. But the Jewish belief, they believed in one God, one God. Now, this was a big thing, of course, when Jesus came and said, I'm the son of God, it got into a lot of trouble. <coughs> Excuse me. But for the Jews, there is only one God. And they also believed that they were 
the children of God, the children of God. Now, in the New Testament, we go on to know and believe that there's only one name which we can be saved. Obviously, the name of Jesus, right? And we also know in the New Testament that we are children of God. I read it out to you, the sons of God. Now that goes against all humanism, where humanism says all roads lead where? To Rome, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So the Jewish, so the Greek culture was carried by the Romans and all roads lead to Rome. Now we believe that God, although he rules and reigns in the heavens, he also lives inside of us. No other religion believes that in the sense that God who rule and reigns in the heaven, comes and lives within us. <coughs> oh, excuse me, I have to get a drink of water. I'm running out of fresh air here. So the Jewish culture was one of a God who cared for them, who protected them, right? The other cultures were at the mercy of how their gods felt that day. Did you hear just what I said? The Jewish culture was one of a God who cared for them, who protected them. The other cultures were at the mercy of how their gods felt that day. Were the gods angry with them? Were the gods pleased with them? And so they were at the mercy of that. But hallelujah, we know our God cares for us. We know our God protects us. Amen. So you've heard me say it before, that Peter and Paul did not convert to Christianity. They just found the Messiah and they carried on. They left, obviously, the law behind, but they were still Jewish in their philosophy of, of their thought about God and how God was their protector, how God cared for them, how God dwelt with them, tabernacled with them. Amen. And so in 300 AD, it was Constantine, the Roman Empire, who merged the political system and the religion together. He moves the state. Now, I hope you don't mind if I take a drink because I don't want to start coughing and splutting. You'll think I've got COVID, right? <laughs> Just joking. Mm. Ah, well. That's better. It's all work doing this, you know. Any case, so the thing is in 300 AD, Constantine, the Roman Empire, he was the one who merged the political and the religion together. In other words, state and church, forming the Roman Catholic Church in 300 AD. Now, Rome embraced Christianity as a state religion. Constantine's mother, Helena, she had a huge influence on this. Now, their influence brought the Romans and the Greeks into Christianity in such large numbers. But another thing happened here as well. Another thing that happened was a rise of anti-Semitism. Now, being, you know, they were anti-Jews. That is nothing new. Isn't it amazing? The Jewish nation has been so persecuted by so many people. If you know your history, by so many people down, down through the ages. And even, you know, uh, if I can use the words Christian, I know when I was in... Um, Wittenberg for Martin Luther's 500th anniversary, preaching over there, the privilege of that. But there were protesters out because Martin Luther had this thought that Jews killed Jesus, you know. And uh, so the thing is, is that even if I said even Christians have been part of that and some in the world today, unfortunately, have got that thought, you know. And, and right throughout, I mean, right throughout history, you've got to go back to Esther and Haman. You know the story in the book of Esther. It was like, let's kill the Jews, right? And, and she saved them. But Haman, he wanted to kill them. And uh, the thing is, is because they say the Jews killed Jesus. It was actually the Romans, of course, who nailed him to the cross. But, and I'm not blaming the Romans. We, we actually, let's be honest, if you read the Bible and know the Bible, it's all of us who crucified the Lord. Our sin put him up there, right? Paul talks about that. And so we're not out to blame the Romans or the Jewish or any, anybody. And, but there's been dozens of world leaders that have wanted to exterminate the Jewish people. I mean, obviously Hitler was a, a known one in our time, but, but today even the president of Iran said, let's wipe them off the mat. You know, now we got the Taliban back in, in power in Afghanistan and so forth. And so in the 14th century, just to give you some idea, the bubonic plague, talking about plagues, um, this was a terrible one, ravaged Europe. And guess who got the blame for that? The Jews got the blame for that. It was estimated, I was just reading about this, was estimated that over 100,000 Jewish people were burned alive as scapegoats because of that plague. Isn't that amazing? People always want to blame somebody else, don't they? You know, often they want to blame Christians for this or blame people for that. Let's get back to 300 AD when the church separated Christianity from the Jews. It was a Greek culture through the Romans that came into the church. So in the Greek culture, you got division between the secular and religion. The Jews didn't have that. They didn't have that. God was in everything. 
Isn't he Jehovah Jireh, my provider, Jehovah Rapha, my healer? So in the Jewish philosophy, in the Jewish mindset, God was in everything, the very air we breathe, right? And so it's Jehovah this and that. You know, there's many names of God. I've got a list of 21 of them. They say there's more, but for every area of our life, God was the very source. Now, the Greek philosophy is a worship of reason, intellect, in other words. You know, uh, the Bible says they have knowledge and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. You know, knowledge increases. But, but, but the Greek philosophy, they want to understand everything. They want to reason all things. They want to be educated. Now, nothing wrong with education, but when it takes us away from God, there's something wrong with it. And so with the Jews, it was a heart thing. It was a heart that mattered, not so much the head. I often say people miss heaven by eight inches from their head to their heart, right? And so with the Jews, it was their heart. And we need to be people who are led by the Spirit. When we talk about the heart, we're talking about the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit, not be led by rationale, not be led by a mind. Now, we've got a mind. We don't want to become Christians who toss away our brain. I'm not saying that. God can use our brain. We know we've got a left and a right side and, you know, and all that. It's a very complex. Uh, they say there's nothing like the brain. It's incredible. But remember Daniel when he spoke, the sons of Zion will overcome the sons of Greece. And so we need to overcome the mindset that often we are brought up, that we learned at school, that is in our society, it's rife in our society. And as a church, we need to make the choice to rise up and overcome what I'm talking, the gods of Greece, overcome the spirit of the world, in other words, overcome the spirit that brings fear and brings control. That's the Antichrist spirit, right? You know, the devil comes to rob, kill and destroy. It's Jesus who comes to bring life. And we all know that the West struggles the West struggles to understand the spiritual world. You'll often see a headline in the paper where maybe a rugby player is fighting his demons, you know, of alcohol, or, you know, people find their demons out there, you know, they even maybe mental health them, whatever they, 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 but they struggle to understand their spiritual world. It's all about intellect and reason. The kingdom of God, hear me now, is about revelation. Let's be honest, you cannot enter the kingdom of God without a revelation that Jesus is Lord and you need saving. What happens? The penny drops, the light comes on. You have a revelation. And that's how we live by revelation, how God speaks to us through his word, right? And so you, got, you enter the kingdom through revelation, but often people get born again, then they want to reason it all out. They want to understand. You will never understand God completely. He's way beyond our reasoning, way beyond. I mean, you know, I just tell you right now, God is just so a massive, awesome. There's no words that can describe him. You think about it, he numbers the hair on everybody's head. He calculates the dust of the earth. He, he, the nations are but a drop in the bucket. And so the universe and the microscopic world, one extreme to another, God is just tremendous. And that's my God. That's your God. Hallelujah. And people in other countries outside the Western world know all about demons, all about witchcraft. Hello. I mean, look at Haiti. It's the witchcraft capital of the world. But even when people get sick in those countries, they visit a witch doctor, right? So other people recognize their God. You go up to Bali. Many of you have been to Bali. I've never been there, but that is, is full of temples. And, you know, you've got um, Hindu and you've got Buddha and so forth, Thailand, India, statues, idols. I mean, outside the Western world, people understand the spiritual world and they have all these gods in the West. We don't see the gods of Greece, but they do walk among us. And these, those gods that we've adopted and that are living among us, and, and often we will tokenize them. And uh, I mean, I often think we tokenize these things. I often think about our, our culture and even in Australia with the Aboriginal culture, you know, now you see in a rugby game, they call up the, the fathers of the past and all this. And I don't want to belittle anybody's culture, but it's interesting, even in Marydom, there's different gods that they have. And so sometimes we, we pay token, you know, when somebody, even a whale dies on the beach now, they got to say, you know, a, a Mary prayer over it. Uh, it's not in the name of Jesus normally. And so the thing is, we will tokenize other people's gods. Uh, even government does this with, with Marydom today. And please hear me right on this. But the thing is, they won't, they won't accept the name of Jesus. They've kicked him out of parliament. He's not in parliament anymore. And yet Jesus is the name by which we may be saved. And so we tokenize and we understand in our Western culture, people do have other gods. That's my point. And yet, you know, we have idols 
in our country, but they have no face. I mean, even monetary uh, finance is a God in the Western world. We know that. Um, leisure is a God in the Western world. They often have no face. People idolise these things. People crave after these things. People worship these things, right? Um, even self can be a God. But the thing is, they're not like the idols in Bali and Africa and India and so, but make no mistake, they do walk among us and they're here. But in our Western culture, uh, we think we know everything. We think we're smarter. We think we're more intellect. And so, you know, we don't believe in the spiritual world. But hey, half the world, well, not half the world, the majority of the world do. Uh, we just think the whole world revolves around the Western countries. But my friend, just because you can't see the spiritual world, just because you can't see the demons, uh, I'm sure everybody's experienced at times where the hair stood up on the back of the neck. So we know there's a spiritual atmosphere. Uh, you know, you can cut the air with a knife. You know, there's atmosphere. We know about it. But but, you know, just because you can't see that spiritual world, like the wind or electricity, you can't see it, but you know that it's there. And so demons and angels. And so I want to encourage you, don't try to reason it out. Let me give you a scripture if, uh, as I bring this to a close. Uh, Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, blood, but against rulers, against powers, against world forces of darkness, against spiritual force of wickedness in heavenly places. So as a Christian, if you don't understand the spiritual world, and if you don't get a grip on this, then you're going to be overcome because you're not going to recognize that you've got an enemy that's out to take you out. And 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for our weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortress. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. We're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So what is the culture of today? Well, you think about the Western world, you think about New Zealand, and we could talk about Australia, America, we could talk about England, we could talk about, you know, a lot of Europe. The Western, the Western culture is my rights, isn't it? I am God. That's bottom line. You know, uh, I'm God. I will do it my way. I, I, will, I will make my own decisions, you know, my rights. And unfortunately, we often, we bring that into the church. I often say being right is not a fruit of the Spirit. We've got to learn to die to ourselves as a Christian. I'm not saying necessarily that may be easy, but with the power of Christ, we can. And then if you're prepared to lose your life, you'll find life. But if you want to hold on to your life, the Bible says, Jesus said, you're going to ultimately lose it. So we see where in the Western church, people put their own thoughts, ideas, even above the Word of God. Listen to me now as I bring this to a close. It's very important. If they don't agree with the Word of God, even take the issue of gender today, which is like a hot potato. Isn't it crazy uh, where the world is right now? We've got this whole conversion therapy bill right before us, and I'm going to be encouraging the church to write a submission. You, I'm not going to go into it now. I don't have time. But the thing is, is that if we don't agree with the Scriptures in relation to gender, we put our own thoughts and our own ideas and our own culture above the Word of God. And so we're walking and not as a son of God, not as a son of Zion, but as a son of Greece. And so if it, doesn't, if it doesn't fit the culture of the day, then we often want to dismiss the word of God. But the word of God abides forever. Amen. And the word of God says in the beginning, God created male and female. Full stop. And the thing is, of course, even marriage is between a man and a woman. But because we think, oh, well, our culture doesn't fit today, we want to dismiss it. We want to say it's irrelevant. We want to say it's old fashioned. No, you're just stepping into the culture and, and the kingdom of, of, of Greece, not the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of Zion. And so it's not outdated, it's not irrelevant, right? I mean, even people, I know Christians today even don't agree on giving. I mean, how shallow is that? They don't want to give. And yet, you know, they know the scriptures, given you shall receive. But, but the thing is, is that, you know, and, and so the thing is, is that they want to put their own thoughts above the word of God. Wow, this is incredible. I mean, think about confessing the power of the tongue, just confessing. I'm, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Or am I defeated? Am I beaten down? Or, you know, hey, take pride in yourself and all this kind of stuff. Well, you've got the wrong philosophy in life. And so I know that people are strongly opinionated today, but that can be our downfall because we think we're God, that we've got to get it our way. We get so upset and so easily if we don't think our opinion is adopted. And you know, and I know, you get 10 people with 10 different ideas, you'll have 10 different opinions, right? Likes and dislikes, you know, people don't all like the color of blue. Well, blues for boys, right? <laughs> Just got you going right there, right? That's a cultural thing right there. Any case, likes and dislikes. <laughs> it's not hard to upset people today, is it? 
I'm just I'm getting cheeky. I better stop. But unity is, hey, I'm in my own home, so I've got a bit of freedom here. No? <laughs> unity is very hard. Uh, and, and it's hard to come by in our Western church, unity. But it's unity that commands a blessing to get people to be of one heart, one mind, one accord. We've got to die to ourselves. We've got to die to our, our opinions, as it were, and abide by the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? The Word of God says, God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to a knowledge of eternal life. So we've got to be about winning souls. God says, I will, or Jesus said, I will build my church. We've got to be about building the church, right? I mean, we could take go through it, but the Western culture wants to question everything. Why, how, what, and so forth. And those things can be a killer of faith, a killer of faith. And they can be a killer of vision as well. How do you kill a vision? Well, just question it, you know. And, uh, you know, the vision to see soul saved. How could you question that vision when it's in the Word of God? Uh, I mean, it just goes on. But we know Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without a progressive vision, we're going to dwell carelessly. So the church culture, the church culture, the Bible culture should be one of faith, right? Reaching out, stretching out, taking steps of faith. One of unity, one of togetherness, one of generosity, one of generosity, one of expansion, one of growth, one of friendliness. I mean, I'm, I can't go through all the cultures that we hold dear in the church, but these are kingdom cultures and we need to have them. Communism and socialism, and it's amazing how the world, even America, the rise of socialism today it happened so quickly. But hey, let's be honest, Afghanistan, 11 days, it was all over. Amazing. <laughs> They've been there 20 years fighting, 11 days. I mean, incredible. So socialism has a culture as well. If you go to these countries, communist countries, socialist countries, you'll feel the oppression there. You can see it. You can feel it. I've been to some of these places. I even remember visiting, uh, uh, going to Prague, and what a beautiful city. And we went out in the country. Now, that hasn't been under uh, communism and Marxist rule for quite a while now, but you could still feel the oppression in people. You could see the impression, uh, oppression in people, the poverty, the hardship. I mean, you know, it's still there, even though uh, there's been a few years of freedom there. Imagine living in North Korea. Imagine being in North Korea. I'm not talking about that kind of unity, cookie cutter unity. I'm, not, I'm talking about unity around the Word of God, not around a man, right? But you can see the outworking of it in North Korea. You can see the oppression, the loss of identity, the conformity and so forth. Hinduism has a culture. You can feel it. Have you ever been by a Hindu uh, temple? I mean, you know, I'm talking to Christians now. You can feel it. I mean, you know, the culture of nations. Likewise, one should be able to feel the culture of the church. It should be the culture of Zion. Amen. And it should be different to the world that we live in. And it should be different, not to our homes, by the way. We need the kingdom culture in our home. But when one person steps into the church, they should, wow, there's something different about this place. I can see joy in this place. I can feel something in this place, you know, and that's the culture of the church. And that's the sons of Zion gathering together. So when people come into contact with us, they, they should say, there's something about you. There's righteousness, peace and joy flowing from your life, which is what the kingdom of God is. You can't see it, but it's here. You can feel it. Hallelujah. In the spiritual, right? And you can see the fruit of it, the fruit of it as the seeds that are brought through the crop. And, and of course, in the world, the kingdom in the world, you can see the seeds that are being harvested and coming ripe today. The rebellion. Do I have to talk about the rebellion? Do I have to talk about individuals, right? The immorality, the lawlessness, that those seeds that have been sown. I mean, just turn on the TV. I mean, 16 year olds are stabbing people. In Australia, um, pick on Australia for a moment, there's a great rugby player over there. Many of you know him, big Samoan guy. And yet a 14-year-old and a 15-year-old and somebody else, three of them, went in and ran, did a house break in and they stabbed this guy. 14 years of age. I mean, this is the seeds that we're reaping today because we've left the kingdom culture and we've adopted this whole other culture. And so I could go on. You know, the USA was formed by Pilgrim Fathers and it brought the blessing of God to America, rose to be the greatest country in the world. No two ways about it. But over the years, other cultures have arrived. And on the shores of USA, and we've seen it now slide away from the one true God, even on their dollar note, in God we trust. And now the seculars, the Marxists, they've all risen up and destroying and destroying the foundations. And we see the mess in America today. Hello, isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? Think about this. You know, the Taliban, he's on YouTube. The Taliban's on YouTube. Donald Trump, 
The president of the free world, the ex-president, has been banned from YouTube. Think about that. Think about that just for a moment. Talk about the cancel culture. But so what I'm saying is that you see the mess in America, the division, the deeply divided, the, the fighting and so forth. And New Zealand's not exempt. No two ways about that. I don't want, uh, as I said, to talk about the legislation that's being shoved through on this conversion bill, on the hate speech bill. We do need to talk about it. You need to be aware of it. And there's another battle to fight, the abortion one. We lost that one. But I close, the spirit of Greece, and I close with this, and I don't want to go over time, but hey, what else you got to do in lockdown? But the thing is, is that they love uh, a couple of things. They worship three things. This spirit of Greece. They, they love and worship reason. They love, this is a Greek philosophy now. You go back to Greece. They love reason. They love beauty and they love pleasure. Hello, am I talking about the modern Western world or not? Reason, beauty and pleasure. Now, remember also that sport came out Olympia came out of Greece, right? And when you think about how we care for our sports stars uh, and, and, and don't take care of people like nurses and, and people on, on the front line who are really doing the great work and you're paying $160 million on a two-year deal to a basketball player. I mean, get your head around that is ridiculous. And, uh, you know, in soccer, uh, I'm not belittling these people. It's just that if, if they're going to be paid that to kick a ball around, we should be paid that, right? I mean, well, you might think I'm not, shouldn't, but you might think you should. But in any case, uh, Missy, I think it was $40 million just just to join another club and $60 million a year. I mean, hello, and we got people who are working with disabled people. We got help, people helping prisoners and so forth who are having to do it for love. I mean, it's just out of kilter. But of course, they idolize sport and we idolize sport. No two ways about it. And I love sport, by the way, but I'm not going to worship it. The spirit of, I'm not going to, you know, not go to the house of God on a Sunday just because the warriors are playing at the time of church and that kind of thing. So the spirit of Greece, the spirit of Greece, you know, Greece, and it's not, Greece, Greece, it's G-R-E-E-C-E, -E -E, you know that. They want to explain everything. Emotion, love, mercy, compassion, grace. They all want to reason it out. And so now here in the West, we, can, we can't even relate even to the basics of God's makeup. Think about it. We can't even relate to God who is love, God who is full of mercy, God who is full of compassion. Why? Because we want to reason it all out. We, all, we want to understand it all. And you won't understand it, but they want to reason it all out. Friends, you cannot explain God. He's beyond fathoming. You can only trust in Him. You can't question Him. He's beyond reasoning. Friend, as I close, and that's my fourth close, you cannot explain the Red Sea opening up. You cannot explain the walls of Jericho coming down. You can't explain the virgin birth. You can't explain the miracles of Christ, the walking on water, the raising of Lazarus. You can't explain him rising from the dead. It's just a matter of believing. My last scripture, Colossians 2 verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of man, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Did I just say that? And did I just sum up exactly what I've been talking about? See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of man, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Wow. So how do we overcome the spirit of Greece that is working in our society today? That spirit that's hindering people from coming to Jesus and those that have come from hindering them from trusting in Him completely? How do we remove the veil? How do we deepen our faith? Well, Jesus said, I have given you all authority and it's through prayer and it's through worship. Just like Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, I talked about it, that it was an issue of prayer and it was an issue of worship. Isn't it interesting? The whole 6-6 six, six mark of the beast thing is all over worship. And it is in his name that we exercise authority to pray against the prince of Greece, just like Daniel did, did in Daniel chapter 10. That's how Daniel pulled down this prince of Persia and so forth. So it's a supernatural. That's what I'm talking about. It's a supernatural that shows the power of God and that will confound people's reason. Well, I want to thank you. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I, I just, I think this is an awesome message for the day because we are living in a day where we really do need to make up our mind. Whose side are we on? Whose side are we on? Which side of the fence are we? Obviously, it begins by putting up your hand and saying, Jesus, come into my life. Uh, you know, I don't know whether you've ever given your life to Christ. You may be watching me now just as a visitor to an online service and 
and but there's something that I've said or something in the music or something in the atmosphere that you know. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm just really praying Really, I really am praying for our nation and even the world. I, I've heard of stories like Wigglesworth. He'd walk in, down the street and people would fall on their knees and repent. I've known what it's like to walk into a room and people have got convicted because I've been there. And, uh, you know, for God to convict people, the Bible says that it's the Holy Spirit that comes to convict of sin and of righteousness and the coming judgment. We will all stand before God. And uh, so people don't want to talk about that today, but it's in the book. I can't help but talk about these things. And so I want to encourage you to open up your heart and give your life to Christ. Maybe you're away from God right now. You're not, you know, you're new months, but you're not at peace with God. You're not right with God. Can I encourage you to open up your heart too? And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And, and a Christian, you know, I know the majority, church people, City Impact church people, Let's be sons of Zion. Let's not fall into the culture of the world and, you know, want to reason everything, want to argue with everything, want to give, you know, just, you know, I mean, people do. But let's, let's be people of faith, people of vision. Let, let's be people of the Word of God. And just because we, you know, because we've been brought up in our culture and we don't understand that or agree with that and it's in the Word of God, you know, let's agree with God, not with what we have been taught, right? And so I want to encourage you to believe the Word of God. Hold fast to the Word of God. Believe in the church. Believe in your pastor. Believe in those that are, are put into your life to speak into your life. And so I want to encourage you today to, as a Christian, just to make sure that you're deeply planted, deeply rooted in the kingdom of God and the sons of Zion. You're joined here with Christ. Hallelujah. And